All right, well, welcome everyone. We are right at the top of the hour, so we can go ahead and get started. Again, welcome. My name is Sierra King, and I am the Admissions and Program Services Manager at the Data Incubator. And we are a fellowship, scholarship, and placement company. We promised you an excellent info session focused on US immigration that will be led by attorney Adam Moses, an associate attorney at Wilde and Weinberg. And Adam will provide an understanding of basic concepts of US immigration, which will allow students to develop a plan to pursue job opportunities in the United States. To start things off, I would like to give you a quick overview of our program and everything that we offer. Then I'll pass off to Adam to walk you through the basics of US immigration, and we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Please place all questions in the Q&A section and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, our session is an hour long today, so if we don't get to all of your questions, please email us at admissions at the and we will be happy to help you. We'll also include Adam's email address in the chat so you can reach out to him directly if you have any specific immigration questions. So with that, let's get started. So the data incubator focuses on training people to become data scientists. And why is that important? Well, it's really because data scientists have the ability to work with the latest tools on unstructured and structured data to drive business value. This is a big need in the world right now. We work with companies in a variety of industries and every company has data and wants to use that data to drive value for them. There are a lot of other data focused programs out there. So I'm sure you're wondering what we do at the data incubator that is a bit different. Well, what we found is when you look at training, there are really two types, one being fast paced and efficient and the other being slower and focusing on understanding and completion rates. University is one example where you'll receive a more detailed understanding, but with a lot more time invested. And then on the job training is usually very quick and efficient, but maybe you're not fully understanding what you're doing. So we've taken all of these aspects and combined them together to find a great middle ground for training. Our program is fast paced. You'll walk out of the program knowing a lot about data science or data analytics and real world business, app real world business applications of both and with a deeper understanding as you'd get from university. All of our instructors are PhD and master holders and have completed this program themselves and know how to provide that in-depth training that you are looking for. So we're so excited to announce that for our summer 2021 cohort, we'll be offering three data focused programs. We'll be offering our successful full-time data science fellowship program and a more flexible version of that, our part-time data science fellowship program and then our brand new data analytics program as well. So let's discuss the similarities in all of our program offerings. All of our programs are intense. They are built around data focused curriculums and we offer both full-time and part-time programs. And both are packed with a lot of information and tools. All of our programs are thorough. Each week focuses on a different data science tool or approach as well as data analytics. And in addition to our lectures, we have our students participate in hands-on practice. And we really believe in fostering an interactive learning environment. And so in each program, students will work on a mini project that focuses on the data tools you are studying. Additionally, all of our programs are very collaborative. We want students not only to work with their colleagues and instructors, but also have the opportunity to network and connect with our hiring partners. And all of our programs are career focused. We have career coaches that help you succeed in your data focused careers. You'll not only learn how to present your best self by attending our career search workshops, but you'll also have the opportunity to work with one of the number one resume writing companies to get a polished resume and cover letter. And lastly, all of our programs are interactive. Every student in our programs are provided a Jupyter server for the duration of the course. So students can follow along and lecture and see and edit raw code. And students will also receive immediate feedback via our interactive reader. So here is an overview of our full-time data science curriculum broken down by week. Please email us again at admissions at the datingcubator.com for a more detailed curriculum overview. And then the part-time program, the part-time data science program lasts for 20 weeks with classes held on Mondays and Wednesdays from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern and expect to spend 10 hours per week working outside of class on your assignments. 
you'll still receive the same excellent curriculum and training as our full-time program, but at a slower pace. And the sessions are live and instructor-led, so you're still able to interact with your instructors and ask questions. So we're also, again, very excited to announce our part-time data analytics program. The part-time program lasts for 20 weeks with classes held Mondays and Wednesdays from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And you can also expect to spend 10 hours per week outside of class. And again, office hours will be available each week. And then here is I'm a, on a, I'm on a presentation. data Sorry. overview with our data analytics curriculum broken down by week. And please, again, email us at admissions at the datingcubator.com for a more detailed curriculum overview. So a big component of our program that we really pride ourselves in is helping our students not only grasp data science concepts, but also getting placed in that field. Our analyst program is brand new, so we don't have data here yet, but for our data science fellowship program, 97% of the students that go through our program are currently employed outside of academia and 82 are employed within six months of, 82%, I'm sorry, are employed within six months of completing the program. So those are really great numbers. We're really proud of them. We've worked hard for them. And that's part of the challenge, not only learning content, but being able to transition into a data science or data analyst role. And that's where our program stands out because we help you to do both. So where are our graduates now? Where are they working and what are they doing? Again, data is not available for our analyst program just yet, but for our data science fellowship, this will give you an idea. Our graduates are working in 55 different industries and some of the common industries we see are computer software, internet, IT, financial services, and biotech. And then some of the typical job titles we see are data scientist, data analyst, research scientist, software developer, and product manager. And these titles and roles vary depending on the company and industry, but these are just some that we've placed in the past. And here is a short list of some of our data science fellowship hiring partners. Many of these companies are also hiring for data analyst roles, but we'll be focused on building a separate network of hiring partners dedicated solely to our data analyst program as well. One of the questions we get asked a lot is, do we offer any financial options? And if we offer assistance and the answer is yes, we do. Especially during times like these, it's hard because people may have the extra time to participate in our program, but limited cash flow. So we want to help you with both. We partner with LEAF to provide an income sharing agreement. It's great. You can participate in our program with just a deposit down and you won't be required to make any payments until you've graduated and are working and earning more than $40,000 annually. We also provide loans through Skills Fund, and Skills Fund offers three different options, one being deferred payment, two interest only, and three immediate repayment option. And lastly, for many of our part-time programs, companies are willing to sponsor or pay for their employees to go through the program. It's a win-win. You get to learn great stuff in the evening and be able to apply it to your job during the day. If that's something that you think your company would be interested in or you'd like to present to them, we do have a letter we can provide you with to help lay out the program and all of the benefits of attending. So where are we at right now? Well, we run multiple cohorts a year and our spring cohort, cohort is actually halfway through their program, but our application for our summer cohort is now open. And our summer cohorts will run from June 28th to August 20th for our full-time program and June 28th through November 12th for our part-time program. As I mentioned earlier, the full-time program is eight weeks long and the part-time is 20 weeks. And some specifics about our data science application. Again, we ask you to submit your application by May 7th for our data science and our data analyst program. And then you'll have 72 hours to complete the data science coding challenge from the time you open it. And the challenge deadline is May 10th. You can't complete the challenge unless you submit the application. So just in general, I recommend you complete the application and challenge sooner than later to avoid any technical issues. We're not able to open after that deadline. And then some specifics about our data analytics application. It's broken down into two parts before we make a decision, one being the application and then the optional diversity scholarship and then the interview. The application deadline is also May 7th, and then we'll be making decisions at the end of May. And if you're interested in applying to our programs, which I hope you are, you can go to the datingcubator.com slash apply to submit your application. 
And if you have questions about your specific situation, this presentation, or going through the application process, please reach out to us again, admissions at thedatingcubator.com, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. So with that, I will now pass off to Adam to lead you through our immigration info session, and then I'll be back on at the end to hopefully answer some any questions that you guys have. So I will stop sharing my screen, Adam, so you can share. Perfect. Thank you. Um, one second. All right, everyone. My name is Adam Moses. Um, uh, my name is Adam Moses. I am an associate here at Wilds and Weinberg. Uh, I've done, been practicing immigration law for 11 years. Um, uh, I'm now currently the head of litigation, which means I do complex cases. Um, so I don't do business immigration day in, day out, but I've done just about everything in business immigration. My job is to fix problems when business immigration cases go awry. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit. Um, what the goal of today is to kind of give you an overview of some basic concepts about immigration and what it means uh, in terms of being sponsored. Um, if you are outside the United States considering this program, uh, what kind of things would you be looking for? If you're in the United States and considering this program, um, you know, it depends on what visa status you currently have and, and what you're doing. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what this program can give you in terms of new options and and opportunities down the road. Uh, so part one, we'll just do some basics in terms of um, how somebody gets a, a visa and what types of visas there are. Part two is gonna be uh, in detail about F1 optional practical training. I'm not gonna go into that as in depth as I do in previous sessions because uh, not really the focus here. Um, part three is going to be discussing uh, just kind of other visa options for people that are already here in the United States. And part four is gonna be a little bit about how, how my experience is discussing immigration with employers for people who require sponsorship. So let's start part one, US immigration basics. So let's say you are outside the United States or you're in the United States and you are going to need sponsorship at some point. Um, so these are just helpful things for you to know um, because you hear a lot of information and misinformation on the internet um, and from friends and chat rooms and whatnot. So I, I find it to be helpful to, to kind of arm yourself with as much knowledge as possible so that you can talk intelligently and know, uh, know what the terminology is and, and, and know what, start building a strategy that, that works for your goals. Um, so first of all, when you talk about immigration status in the United States, uh, there's really only four statuses. Uh, there, actually six, but for right now, we're just gonna talk about four of them. Um, at the tippy top is US citizen. Someone who's born in the United States has a US passport um, and can work anywhere and live anywhere, right? That is kind of the goal for many people. Uh, below that are permanent, lawful permanent residents. You, one reason I put this here, because I want to emphasize that there's a lot of different words for that. Lawful permanent resident is also known as an LPR. It's also known as a green card holder. It's also known as an immigrant. Those are all the same thing. That means someone who's gonna come live in the United States for the rest of their life. Uh, and they, people who are granted permanent residency uh, can, will be given a green card and can work anywhere they want, um, can travel in and out as much as they want as long as they continue residing here. And then at the bottom, or number three rather, is non-immigrants, uh, people who have a temporary visa uh, that is for a finite, a very specific purpose for a finite period of time. And those are kind of the alphabet soup a through U visas. And of course, fourth and finally are people who are out of status, uh, snuck through the US border or overstayed a visa. So, um, okay, so let's talk just briefly. Um, for people who are here as an F1 uh, and are working, you know, how, how, does, how does somebody get sponsored for an employment based visa? Um, well, generally speaking, there's going to be three steps uh, petition, application, and admission. A uh, petition uh, means that uh, the company files a petition for you with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, an agency within the Department of Homeland Security. And that just says that the person has the right credentials for this type of visa and that the person and that the job meets the requirements for that type of visa. And again, we're going to go into all the different visa categories later, but right now we're just talking about the process. So a company files a petition by filing this I-129 with USCIS. Um, 
Then if the person is outside the United States, they take that approval notice from the approved petition and uh, they go to a US embassy or consulate abroad, they apply for their visa. And then once they have that visa, they are admitted to the United States in a non-immigrant visa status, usually with a date that they have to leave by or something known as duration of status, which means as long as the program is. That's how F F1 student visas and J1 trainee intern visas are, are granted. So, so I said that when a company sponsors a person, they, they file a petition for them. Uh, and when that petition is approved, USCIS issues something that on the left-hand side called an approval notice. And the individual takes that beautiful approval notice. They go to the consulate and they get something that looks on, on the right-hand side, which is uh, a non-immigrant employment-based visa. So talking about non-immigrant visas, um, so the, the, the basic, I should mention, the basic plan that most people do, they, they try to get on a non-immigrant visa. Often they start with a student or a J-1 visa. They then try to pivot to an, a, a purely employment-based visa, a non-immigrant visa. And then while they're on that purely non-employment-based non-immigrant visa, they look for the company to sponsor them for a green card, and then they go for citizenship. So for many people, the end goal for right now is how do I get a non-immigrant employment-based visa? Well, First of all, you have to know what non-immigrant employment-based visas are out there. And this is kind of an overview of what all non-immigrant visas there are. Um, some of them are super applicable, some are not so much, but uh, going through it up at the top are business visitors. That's not really an employment-based visa. That's just for people who are coming in to do uh, training or uh, tourism, uh, but doesn't allow you to work in the United States. E1, E2, those are the treaty visas for people who have invested a certain amount in the United States or doing a lot of trade between their home country and the United States. E3 is the Australian uh, specialty occupation visa, only for Australian nationals. Uh, below that are the H1B for professional occupations or specialty occupations as they're called, uh, jobs that require at least a bachelor's degree or higher in a, a specialty. Below that are H1B1 uh, free trade categories for Chilean and Singaporean nationals. Uh, very similar to H1B, just uh, easier to get. Uh, J1 is, a, is an odd visa. We're going to go into that in more detail later. We're going to go into all this more detail later. Uh, but that's kind of the uh, exchange program where you can serve as an intern for up to a year or a trainee for a year and a half. Um, L1 are international transferees. Probably very few people are going to be eligible under that. TN is a Canadian and Mexican only under NAFTA um, for certain occupations here in the United States. And the O1 is for aliens of extraordinary ability. So, um, so before we move on to green cards, yeah, just like, again, many of you are gonna be here in F1 student visa status uh, or wrapping up your F1 and you're on the cusp of, of thinking about, well, what visas are gonna come next? Well, this is that conversation. These are the visas that will come next. Um, and hopefully that, hopefully, uh, that incubator will help you get to that next stage. Now, if you already have a good employment based on immigrant visa, like H1B or an O1, then the next step for most, many people who want to you know, permanently live here is going to be obtaining lawful permanent resident status. So as I mentioned earlier, lawful permanent resident status allows individuals to permanently live and work in the United States. Um, you can work anywhere you want. You can later apply for citizenship. You just can't vote and you can be deported for certain criminal convictions and you have to continue to live here. You can't want to go abroad. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of implied with the whole resident thing. Um, how does somebody get a green card? Um, you can get a green card either uh, sponsorship by a U.S. citizen relative or a uh, or green card holder relative in some instances. Uh, you can be sponsored by a U.S. company for certain jobs. And in some instances, you can self-sponsor, meaning that you just apply yourself if you are an alien of extraordinary ability or an alien of exceptional ability whose field of expertise is within the national interest. Uh, there's also a thing called the diversity visa lottery and uh, the green, uh, US government gives out 50,000 50, green cards every year to, uh, for na to nationals of countries of low immigration. And the list there is a somewhat outdated list of countries that are not eligible for the diversity visa lottery, meaning that uh, if you're from one of those countries, you cannot apply to be one of those 50,000. Finally, uh, just by way of completion, uh, there's also asylees. Uh, they're eligible to apply for green card status, people who are afraid to go back to their home country. So I mentioned that in non-immigrant visa world, 
uh, there's kind of the alphabet soup of visas, A visas, B visas on down the line to U visas. Um, in, in, in the green card world, we don't talk about alphabet soup necessarily. We talk about um, employment-based first preference. So Congress gives out a certain number of green cards every year, and the number of green cards we give out are kind of categorized by these preference categories. Um, at the tip top, you'll have EB1, uh, which they give the most green cards out, and that's two aliens of extraordinary ability, outstanding researchers, and multinational managers. Below that are EB2 and EB3. Um, EB2 is generally speaking a master's degree. Uh, well, okay, for so big caveat here, EB1 uh, petitions can be self-sponsored. So if you're an alien of extraordinary ability, at least you can uh, apply for a green card on your own. EB2 and EB3 are more complicated. For the most part, most EB2 and EB3 requires you to have at least a bachelor's degree for um, EB3. And for EB2, the job must require at least a master's degree or five years of progressively responsible experience. But the big downside for EB2 and EB3 is vast majority of the time, those are going to require not only a, a company to sponsor you, um, but it's also going to require you to, um, it, it's going to require that, that company to certify through the Department of Labor that no one is willing and able to do your job, uh, something called the PERM application or labor certification. So those are those are the ways most people get green cards, uh, EB2 or EB3. If you're Chinese or Indian, then you probably know better than I do that just how long it can take. Um, you know, Indians, it can take upwards of 13 years right now uh, to get an EB2 or EB3 green card. Um, so uh, EB4, just to round out here, EB4 is kind of a catch-all for green cards, religious workers, Iraqi translators, and EB5 are investors. Um, and it's kind of a, a unique thing all to its own. All right, so now that you can see the screen, um, let's move on to, so I'm gonna just briefly move on to part two now, to say, which is a little bit about F1 student visas. Um, and I, I'm not gonna focus too much on this, just if you're on F1 student visa right now, you probably already know that you're allowed to work for at least one year afterwards, um, after you graduate from your degree, or get your degree, and um, that's called optional practical training. Um, and if you have a STEM degree, which many of people here, uh, they will be eligible for an additional two years after that. So maximum three years for people with STEM degrees. Um, so part of my normal presentation is kind of harping on people to, the, the upshot being, uh, if you are nearing the end of your degree program, um, you really need to apply for OPT by submitting an I-765 as soon as possible. Um, processing times for, for these employment authorization documents, which you use to effectuate your OPT, are egregiously long at the moment, um, sometimes taking upwards of seven to 11 months to get. It's, it's kind of a national crisis, or at least a crisis in my field, um, and so you really can't apply too quickly. Um, just as soon as you can apply, you should apply, and that's going to be it for F1 OPT. I want to kind of tra transition now to uh, talking about options post um, OPT, or if, or just if you're here on, as a visitor or living abroad, what you know, what are your options from a, a non-immigrant standpoint? So, first thing to understand is that when you uh, when you get a new non-immigrant visa status, uh, let's say you're here on F1 and you want to change, you can either pick the consular process or you can change status like automatically, like Cinderella. Um, you know, right now with COVID, it's strongly recommended that everyone change status if at all possible uh, because the consulates are basically non-functioning at the moment. Um, the problem with changing status like Cinderella, of course, is that um, in order to do that, you have to timely file. Um, you cannot travel while that change is, is pending. And most importantly, you have to show, you have to demonstrate when you submit your application that you've constantly maintained your non-immigrant visa status. Um, so, One moment. So how do you prove that you've maintained your non-immigrant visa status? Uh, typically, you want to give job letters and prove that you've been working for the correct company. Um, and so it's very important that if you're on an F-1 student visa or any visa, that you're constantly keeping copies of all your pay stubs and your uh, tax documents to be able to show that you've been employed. And also that you, um, every time you change jobs, I recommend that you go ahead and get an employment verification letter on company letterhead. Uh, verifying the amount of time you work for the place, um, your salary and job duties. So what are the major visa options that are available to people? Um, so 
I, I usually talk about this and I split it between visa categories that are open to everybody or non immigrant visa categories that are open to everybody and then country specific. So um, on the standard side there, on the left-hand side, you'll see H1B, O1, and J1. And on the country specific, uh, you'll see E2, E3, TN, H1B1. So let's kind of get into it. So the H1B is the most common, um, H-1B is the most common uh, non-immigrant visa that people are sponsored for, and that's because the standards is relatively low. Uh, you only need to show that uh, you have a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, you don't need you know, extraordinary ability or anything like that. The problem with the H-1B is that it's subject to a cap. Uh, basically, you're, every year in April, um, the government runs a lottery for all the people who apply, and they select uh, 85,000 uh, petitions. And so basically they give out 85,000 new H-1B visas every year. Uh, generally speaking, you have about one third to a half of the chance, or 30 to 50% chance of getting selected. So it's not super high. Um, but if you do get selected, it's a very good visa because it's, uh, it's available for up to six years. Um, it can be extended longer than six years. So if you're Indian or Chinese and the company sponsors you for a green card, it, you're eligible to continue to extend that until you actually get the green card in your hand, which is a major benefit. Um, and after much legal wrangling, uh, spouses are able to work uh, if the beneficiary has been sponsored for a green card. So um, this is somewhat an outdated list. Uh, the upshot being is like, if you were interested in H-1B visas, really you need to start talking to an employer uh, in, in January or February, because it takes some time to get it together and make sure you have the right job and make sure the salary is good and all that good stuff. Uh, another good benefit of the H-1B visa is that if you're here on an F-1 and you have OPT that expires over the summer and a company sponsors you for an H-1, you get an automatic extension of your F-1 uh, OPT employment authorization uh, until October 1st when the H-1B comes into effect. So you file, um, you enter the lottery on April 1st, um, the cases are selected, then the company, file. if you are selected, company files a petition for you. Once that is approved, then uh, you convert, if you're changing status, you convert to H-1B visa status on October 1st. And if your EAD expires in the meantime, you get an automatic extension when they file it on your behalf. There are also uh, options for something called cap exempt H-1B. So, you know, I mentioned that subject to the lottery, no one likes the lottery, no one wants a 30% chance to get selected. So um, the government, uh, there are, it allows for certain employers uh, to be cap exempt. And generally speaking, that's going to be any sort of uh, entity that is either uh, a nonprofit research organization, a governmental research organization, or my favorite type of this uh, entire presentation, institutions of higher learning and affiliated nonprofit entities like hospitals um, that are affiliated with uh, a university, universities. I, I mean, if I was trying to work in the United States, I, I would be applying exclusively through universities, even for their IT back office jobs because they are cap exempt and they can hire as many H-1Bs as they want. And this is a little overview of about how much it costs for an H-1B. Um, it's usually right in the neighborhood of about $5,000. Uh, the other good non-immigrant visa option that a lot of people like is the O-1 visa. The O-1 visa is uh, for aliens of extraordinary ability. Um, the reason people like the, the O-1 is because it's renewable indefinitely and there's no cap. So if you qualify, you can have it for the rest of your life, theoretically. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's, you don't have to worry about some pesky lottery. You know, if you qualify, you qualify. So, the, you know, the O-1 is obviously a very good visa. Um, but the problem with the O-1 is that it's kind of hard to qualify. Uh, to qualify, you have to show that you've had, you've won a major internationally recognized award, like an Oscar or a Nobel Prize, um, or that you've garnered at least three of the following criteria. I'm going to go in those criteria in a little bit more detail now. Um, so again, you need three of the following. Um, first criteria we're going to talk about international awards. Um, you know, it needs to be a professional award. It can't be an academic award, like a scholarship. Um, and the results should be published in trade publications or something like that. Second is leading a critical role in a distinguished organization. You were top of your of a job in a hierarchy in a company or a research group. Uh, distinguished reputation, uh, you know, historically means it, that it's got a basically just Googleable. But recently we've seen kind of a crackdown in terms of what 
constitutes a distinguished reputation for an organization. Um, third criteria is publish scholarly works in a trade journal or other major media. Um, this is a good one for anyone who's getting a PhD because by de default, you're going to be published. So that's very helpful to you. Um, fourth category is also helpful for people getting the PhD, judge of the work of others. Um, of course, have held that any type of judgment that you do of peers in the field can constitute this. Um, so if you did any sort of peer review with uh, your colleagues uh, while in getting your PhD, then that's going to be good evidence to show judgment of the work of others. Original contribution is kind of tough. You have to show that you did something, you made something new, like a patent. Uh, but then also does that patent or whatever new contribution you've made to the field, it's actually utilized. So you, you need, if you did make a patent, you need to show that other researchers have utilized your patent or other companies have, have built upon it, which can be kind of tough. There's another one, membership in organizations that show distinguished reputation. No one ever uses that one, it's a weird one. Uh, published material about the alien and the work or their work. Um, the article is written about you, but this is, they're really getting very, very tough on this immigration. Um, really requiring the article to be just about the person. So we've had uh, we've had interviews with people in major publications and they say, well, it's not about you because they just interviewed you, which is insane, but they really are, government's cracking down on that. And then high salary or compensation kind of speaks for itself, but um, again, you know, it depends on what type of job you are. And if you're a stockbroker and you make $2 million, that might not be a high compensation as far as the government's concerned. So that's kind of a wrap up of O1. I mean, O1's a really good visa category. And if you think that, um, you know, I do offer a, a just kind of a, a brief look at your resume. If you want to email me and say, hey, do you think I'm in the ballpark? And we can kind of go from there. J1 visas. Um, uh, so I mentioned this earlier, the J1 is the Cold War visa. It was developed during the Cold War to bring people to the United States and show them, have them return to their home countries and tell everyone that we're better than the Soviets. Um, that's not even a, really a joke. I mean, it's like literally why it was developed. Um, and so relevant here is the J1 is a good visa category, if, particularly if you're abroad and you, you have a foreign degree, since it requires a foreign degree, or alternatively, five years of experience. Um, if you do, um, the company can register with the sponsor. You can go to the Department of State website. You can find a billion sponsors. The company registers with the sponsor, and they complete a training plan. And with that training plan, they um, they basically give you some documents. You go to the consulate, you get your J-1 visa. Um, if you have a degree and less than one year of experience or are still in school, uh, you can get an intern trainee, uh, intern J-1, which is valid for 12 months. And if you have a foreign degree and more than one year of experience or five years of experience total, um, you can get a trainee J-1, which is uh, good for up to 18 months. The problem with the J-1 is then if you're from a developing country um, and the skill that you're going to be working in is, is needed in that country, at least according to the Department of State, um, then you will be subject to something called a two-year foreign residency requirement. And what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, when you get done with your J-1, uh, you, before you can change to another visa status or before you um, can apply for an H-1, uh, you need to... Uh, either go home for two years or get a waiver and waivers are relatively difficult. So um, I've had at least two people in, the, in that incubator who have discovered during this process that they're on a J1 and subject to that two year bar. So definitely want to look into that, but it, it, it's, a, it's a major problem with the J1 for many people. Shifting now, you know, we'll just kind of breeze through these. Um, the country specific, number one is Australian. Australia, if you're from Australia, you know, you can thank John Howard for joining the Iraq war because he, George Bush gave him a visa. It's a great visa. It's for any job that is a specialty occupation, meaning it requires a bachelor's or higher, and you can apply at the consulate or print. Now you can premium process it if you're already here. Uh, it's just a great visa. Similar, very kissing cousin of the E3 is the H1B1, uh, which is for uh, Chileans and Singapore's also specialty occupation, meaning it requires a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, and uh, also very easy to get in terms of um, you can apply here and premium process it, find out in two weeks if you change status, or if you can get an appointment abroad, you know, go to the consulate, get it, come right back. TN is, is, is also a good visa. This is open for Canadians and Mexicans. Uh, Canadians just show up at the border, 
and show a letter from the company saying they're going to work there with a copy of their degree. Uh, Mexicans, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. They have to go apply at the U.S. consulate. If you're already here, you can change status like any other non-immigrant visa and, and, and like Cinderella turn into a TN visa holder. Um, this is a quick overview of how a Canadian gets a TN visa. Basically, you graduate, you find a job in your field, you prepare an offer letter, um, you go to the border pre-flight inspection, um, you show the letter, and you pay your 50 bucks, and the officer will stamp you for a period of three years, and it will look something like this. So the, the problem with the TN, quickly, is that it's not for every single job. Um, I have listed here uh, the types of jobs that you can use for TN and it's computer systems analysts, mathematicians, uh, teachers at universities, uh, engineers, so on and so forth. So it could be a little challenging here in terms of uh, trying to fit a, a data scientist job, but you know, so far I, I haven't heard anyone who graduates from here not be able to get a TN for any other job. So I, I think very high success rate. E2, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but E2 is a great option for a visa category if you are from a country that has a treaty with the United States, which are these. Um, if you're from one of these countries and the E2 is for investment, now there's two flavors of E2. It's someone who invests themselves and starts their own company, or E2 is available to uh, a large company who wants to bring in nationals from the country in which that company is owned. So a Mexican a company that is headquartered and owned in Mexico by Mexican nationals or traded on the Mexican stock exchange, uh, their branch offices here in the United States can bring in as many Mexican nationals as it wants uh, to work as essential employees. So I always say, if you're looking for um, you know, a job here in the United States um, and you're from one of these countries, you know, look for companies that are headquartered and owned and operated in your home country uh, because you kind of have a, a fast track to getting a visa through one of those companies. This is a little bit more about um, green cards. So that's all non-immigrant. Now we're shifting to green cards. Green cards, as I mentioned earlier, is more difficult. First off, EB2 um, is for jobs that require master or higher. Uh, the problem is that the company has to sponsor you and has to uh, get a labor certification from the Department of Labor, which takes a while. Um, extraordinary ability is the uh, green card counterpart to the O1. I say it's the O1 on steroids, and uh, you know, but if you qualify and you can meet those criteria, um, you have a very good shot to getting a green card relatively quickly. Um, outstanding researchers, kind of a blend. Uh, it's EB1, but and you you show two of six criteria, but the problem is is that it, it requires sponsorship by a company that um, it requires sponsorship by a company that is employing various researchers. Finally, uh, the big one is national interest waiver, EB2. Um, so there's an exception for EB2 employees. They can sponsor themselves without an employer if they can show that they are exceptional in the field and that their work is in the national interest. So, um, you know, we always say medicine, nuclear energy, weapons research, uh, cyber technologies, things like that. But, you know, if you, I always say, if you're feeling your gut that it's in the national interest, you could probably make that argument. So yeah, I mean, this is kind of the overview of, of what non-immigrant visa options are available. As I said, I've been doing this for a number of years and um, I know that many, 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 many um, TDI graduates have, have gone on to have long non-immigrant careers. Um, but, you know, I always tell people to kind of go through and see which non-immigrant visa options are, are work for you. If you're outside the United States and you haven't even applied to school, you know, the F1 is probably gonna be the way you start. Um, if you're here on an F1, uh, you know, start thinking about which visas might be up your alley um, and uh, try to, you know, think about what the employer's concerns. Employers usually just want to know how long you, until you can start uh, and what they need to do. So you can always meet with an immigration attorney and talk to them and set up a consultation. Uh, you know, understand what goes into it, what an employer's part would be. And uh, oftentimes, if you go into an interview armed with the knowledge of what they need to do, uh, they don't really mind doing it as long as they know what it is. So I, I think, whoops, sorry, that's it for me. Um, I, I don't think I have a whole lot else. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if we we're going to be doing a Q&A or anything like that. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions that they haven't already put in the chat or the Q&A section that you'd like 
Adam to answer. Please put those in there now. Oh, I, I, I just saw the anonymous entity. Can you apply for a green card as an E2 visa holder? How? Um, so if you're in an E2 non-immigrant visa status, um, can you apply for a green card? Well, again, first, um, so the short answer is yes. Um, you'd have to figure out which green card category you apply under. Are you going to be EB1 Extraordinary Ability? Are you going to be EB, which is great because you can self-sponsor. Are you going to be EB2 National Interest? Again, you can self-sponsor. Or are you going to be EB2, EB3, which means the company has to sponsor you? Um, the short answer is you can absolutely um, apply for a green card in E2 status. The problem is, is, uh, is usually travel. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, once you get a certain way into the E2, into the green card process, um, there's going to be a period of about six months where you're not going to be able to travel. Whereas on an H1B, you can travel immediately the whole time. Uh, so that's why most companies do like to change um, E2s to H1Bs before they start the green card process, but it is not required. So, all right, next question. Uh, do you need to be on OPT to enroll in the Daddy Incubator Program? Or can you enroll simply on an F1 visa? I assume you only need OPT to be able to work after you finish. I'm going to let someone else answer that. So you're not required to be on an OPT to participate in the program. So and then we do have some of our employers that are willing to sponsor students for visa status. Our program, of course, we do not offer that for our students, but it's not a requirement. We have students that participate from all over the world, but if you're looking to work with one of our hiring partners, then you may need to explore some visa options at that point if you're looking to transition to work in the U.S. I just want to mention briefly um, that if you, from an immigration standpoint, if you are in F1 visa status and you want to take some kind of like extracurricular coursework unrelated to your F1 visa schooling, that is typically going to be permitted. So, um, you know, from, an, from an, a violation of your F1 visa status, it, it, it should not be considered a violation of your immigration status. All right. Next question, does the time frame of the green card depend on nationality? I've noticed that friends coming from certain countries tend to have a faster procedure than others, so I wonder. Yeah, so the, the answer is yeah. Um, green cards do take much longer if you're from China and India. So like I mentioned earlier, um, they give out a certain number of green cards every year in these different EB1, EB2, EB3, EB4 categories, but they give the same amount to every single country in the world to make it fair. So if you're from, Mozambique, you, they give out the same number of green cards for Mo, Mozambique nationals as they do Chinese nationals. As you can imagine, they get a lot more Chinese and Indian people who apply. So what happens is those individuals get into these backlogs. Um, so for instance, right now, I can't remember the exact number, someone could correct me, um, an EB3 from India, so a company sponsors an Indian worker, um, for a green card, does the labor certification and files an immigrant visa petition on their behalf, they cannot actually apply for their green card for about 13 years. Um, Chinese nationals, five-ish years, depending on the category. So yeah, the, the Chinese and Indians have a, have a much longer wait than other countries. Um, next one, does the month that TDI count towards unemployment period for OPT? My understanding is that it, it does. Um, so, you know, we didn't get too much into it. Maybe next time I do this particular presentation, I can give more information on that. But yeah, I mean, the training you do for TDI is not going to count as employment. Um, and so, for anyone who's wondering where this question is coming, if you are an F1 student visa, and you apply for OPT, uh, during your first year, you're allowed only 90 days of unemployment. Otherwise, you failed to maintain your uh, F-1 visa status. And during your three years of STEM OPT, you're allowed 150 days. So if you're just doing TDI, uh, that is not employment. Uh, you're not providing productive services for the company. Um, so that would not be employment. And therefore, you would need to find some other type of work um, to satisfy the employment the, the employment requirement. How long can you be in H-1B status for? So the H-1B is valid initially for a period of three years and then is renewable once for an additional three years. 
And then you can renew it indefinitely while you get a green card if the company sponsors you by the fifth year of your sixth year. So if you are in H-1B status and you're in your fourth year, you need to be knocking on your HR's door being like, when are you sponsoring me? When are you sponsoring me? Because you need to get that sponsorship filed by your fifth year so that you can continue to extend your H-1B beyond the sixth year. For the J-1 visa holders, do you suggest that we start TDI as soon as we join the country? Because there's a limited period of 18 months. Oh yeah, yeah. So if you got a J-1, if a company sponsored you for a J-1 and you wanted to make use of your time at TDI, um, it would make a lot more sense to do it at the beginning because um, that way you'll maximize the kind of time that you have to look for other jobs to sponsor you. Just always make sure you're not subject to that two-year foreign residency requirement. All right, how about the TDI program during the 60 days allowed between degree completion and the OPT start date? Sounds like a smart option um, for international students so they can focus on TD programs solely. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, so, well, I, I believe what, Arvind is saying is, um, so you, when you do complete your degree, well, it's not just 60 days. Um, uh, you could, and Arvind, uh, spoiler alert, yeah, it, you sh you're allowed to apply up to 60 days after your, your degree completion date, but you should really be applying the first date possible, which is 90 days prior to your degree completion date. Um, and you should be applying as soon as you can because those EAD, you know, like nothing's worse they're a person who has a hot job offer that they lose because they're waiting on their OPT EAD. But agreed that um, that that kind of window after you degree, complete your degree and before um, your OPT starts is probably going to be ideal for doing the TDI program. Again, if you have questions, please continue to post them in the Q and A section so we can answer those for you. What if we apply for the J-1 visa waiver? Can we do the TDI part-time if we are working with the company during the J-1 period? Um, yeah, so I mean, well, I don't really know. Okay, so like, what if we apply for the J-1? I feel like those are two different questions. I, uh, answering the second one, can we do the TDI part-time if we are working with the company during the J-1 period? So if you're on a J and you're working for your company, you're doing whatever your J is supposed to do, um, kind of just like on the F1, you're allowed to do um, kind of extracurricular um, short-term study classes um, on the side. That's permission, permit, uh, permitted. Um, but I don't really see how that's related for the waiver, um, J1 visa waiver. The sponsorship process, is, when a company sponsors someone, there's three steps. The first step is they file an application for a labor certification called a PERM application with the Department of Labor. Second, that process takes about a year and a half. Um, the second step um, is they file a petition with USCIS saying, look, you know, Department of Labor certified this. Um, can you give this person a green card? That's called an I-140. And the third step is the beneficiary's uh, personal application for a green card. Um, the I-485. So those are the three steps, perm application, I-140, I-485. Um, in order for an H-1B visa holder to continually renew their H-1B until that green card is in their hand, the company needs to have filed an application for a labor certificate, their perm application, 365 days before there's their six year of H-1B time. So if your H-1, if, if you start, uh, I'm put, doing my math on the fly here, but if you started H-1B on October 1st of 2018, that means that you have maximum H-1B time until October 1st of 2024. That means that the company needs to have spawned, filed your PERM application, the first step in that green card process by the fifth year anniversary of H-1B time. So by October 1st, 2023. If they do that, 
then you can continue to renew your H-1B until your green card is actually issued. For PhD graduates, do you recommend EB-1 or EB-2 visas? Thanks. Um, so, I mean, look, if you qualify for an EB-1, you should always go for an EB-1. Um, you know, again, EB-1 is for extraordinary ability, outstanding researchers, and, um, and multinational managers, which is not super applicable. Basically, we're, we're just assume EB-1 extraordinary ability. Um, EB-2 is for master's degree or exceptional ability in the national interest. I presume what you're asking is if you qualify for both an EB-1 self-sponsored extraordinary ability and an EB-2 national interest waiver, which one would you do? Um, this, that's a very easy answer. And that's going to be an EB-1 extraordinary ability because you can premium process that. And that means the government will give you a response as to whether or not you're extraordinary or not within two weeks um, for an additional, uh, I think it's $2,400. I, I can't remember offhand. Um, whereas the EB-2 national interest waiver, uh, that, that, rec that just cannot be premium processed. So it's going to be six to nine months before you find out, which is just kind of annoying. So um, there's other reasons too, but I, back of the envelope and I think that works. I'm a PhD student and my defense is not scheduled yet, but I know it will be sometime in July or August. I want to apply for OPT ASAP. How can I apply for my OPT without knowing when exactly my completion date is? Um, my impression is that you need to know the exact completion date before applying for OPT. Arvin, my friend, email me that question. I, whenever it comes to um, thesis defense, it's always like super specific. There's like a, a bunch of rules that I always have to look up. So email me, my email address is on the first thing. Just give me your question is a little bit more detail. If you wanna include your I-20s, I'll take a look at them, I'll get back to you, but I'm, I'm not gonna be able to answer that right this moment. Any other questions? We have just a couple minutes left, so we can maybe take one or two more questions. So if you have any, please put them in the Q&A section to be answered. As a graduate student F1 visa, I applied for a permanent job and got an offer. Um, what kind of visa do I need to start the job? I have a master's and currently a PhD, both in the US. Um, well, that, that's basically my entire presentation. Um, and, um what well, it would depend on what i mean ideal i mean you'd you'd want an h1b or an o1 unless you're from one of the com country specific um you know canada mexico singapore chile australia that's short answer um so we so if we come to the US for a limited period of time on a J-1 and say we need to return to our home country in, in two years, there are two things here. First, we need to make full use of the 18 months. And secondly, we need to apply for a J-1 visa waiver. Since there is no OPG option for someone on a J-1, how can we fully utilize TDI? Um, yeah, so, okay, listen, I think you probably need to see an immigration attorney, um, you know, and I'm not just saying that to my own horn. The thing is, is that um, you're, okay, so if you do need the waiver, um, waivers, depending on why you're subject to the two-year foreign residency requirement, um, waivers sometimes can be relatively straightforward. Um, to get the J-1 waiver, if you have not received funding from a foreign or U.S. source, um, then you usually can get it by just asking your home country. So you go to the embassy, you ask them for a no objection letter, and they give it to you, and then you'll get a waiver. Uh, but, you know, I think you probably need to see an immigration term. I mean, so the thing is, is if you're starting your beginning of your 18, your 18 months, um, you, you want to do TDI as soon as possible, but then concurrently, you'd want to go ahead and start the process for your J-1 visa waiver. And, you know, you, you'll find out, you, you, I've gotten those done in a flash in some job dead situation. So you should be able to find out at least within six months whether or not you get the waiver. And then that way, once you got the waiver and you've done your TDI, you can make full use of it, is, would be my answer. 
I contacted an immigration lawyer and they said I had a great chance to crack EB2 national interest waiver. I'm concerned for applying because if my university finds out, they may not sign my OPT knowing that I have intentions to switch to an immigrant. So yeah, I hear that question. Um, so um, I have never, I'm just gonna tell you like, so this is one of those shitty questions because like, I can't control what your university does. Like, you know, I, so I can't say, well, they'll never do that because I don't know, Jane down in student services may do that and it may be illegal and it may be wrong or it may be stupid, but they may do it. So I can't definitively say what the university can and will not do. What I can tell you is I've represented people who are here on an F1 and have been in F1 visa status for 20 years while they try to get a green card. And they just keep, keep switching school and get new I-20s, so on and so forth. So while Jane Dunn and HR at your, or at student services may not do that, I've never heard of that happening. And I've dealt with this a lot. <laughs> so that, that's gonna be my answer. I, I've just, I've never heard, because my, I've never heard of, of when a school not being able to issue an I-20 because an I-140 has been filed on a person's behalf. I've never heard of that happening. Well, thanks so much, Adam, for presenting today. I hope everyone found this session to be informative. If you have some more specific questions that you'd like answered or more challenging situations, you're always welcome to email Adam. We put his email address in the chat section. So you may want to make a note of that. Or if you don't have that email address or if you have any questions about the program specifically, you're also always welcome to email us at admissions at the datingcubator.com. Well, thanks everyone so much. Thank you, Adam, again for presenting and thank you for everyone for attending today and hopefully we will see all of your applications soon.